and we are live on Facebook. Facebook, welcome. So glad you are with us. Again, I'm Mike Davis. I am one of the leaders at our fellowship, The Oasis. So glad that you're joining us here for our Sunday, Saturday morning, not Sunday morning, but our Saturday morning study in the Word of God. I want to pray with you as we've just prayed with the members of our fellowship. Let's pray as we get into the study of God's Word, asking him to open our eyes. So Father, as David prayed, we pray this morning, open our eyes to behold wondrous things from your Torah. Lord, show us your ways, teach us your path, lead and guide us into your truth and teach us because you are the God of our salvation. You've said, I will grant you my, my spirit of truth so to, who will lead you and guide you into all truth. So we rely upon you this morning, Lord God, that you will guide us by your spirit into your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you've got your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Genesis chapter three. We're still on our series, Who's the Boss? Women and Men in Biblical and Cultural Context. This is part 12. We've done 12 messages thus far. And we are going to be looking again, something we started last week, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, revisit it. This is the second part of that message. I think it'll be the last part. The, the second part will be the last part of what we're studying here. And today we're going to be looking at the cause of the woman's pain and anguish that God speaks about in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. So in Genesis 3, 16, after Adam and Eve had eaten of the forbidden fruit, God says to them, and says to the woman in verse 16, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, last week, we looked at this passage, and we, um, and, and we looked at the passage, and based upon the work of two scholars, Carol Myers and Joy Fleming, Carol Myers wrote a book called Rediscovering Eve. We were quoting from that. Uh, Joy Fleming also wrote a, a work um, that right now, uh, I think it's Women, women and Men in, 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 uh, in Unity or Biblical Unity, I believe it's called. Uh, but we looked at their works last week. And based upon their work, we looked at the possibility, because they dealt with this passage in their work, we looked at the possibility that this passage can be looked upon differently than the way it is normally interpreted. Uh, the, that the first part of this verse where it says, uh, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception in pain, you shall bring forth children. Normally, this is interpreted as saying that God, in, when it says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception, that's usually interpreted as that God is going to increase her labor pains during childbirth. When she's in labor, he's going to increase the pain. We saw, we looked at the work of Carol Myers and Joy Fleming, and we saw that they interpreted differently. Rather than it being that God was going to interpret their pain when it says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception, we saw, and what we looked at, and you can go back to last week's message, it's on YouTube at KICTV, message number 11, we said that God will increase not really her labor pains, but her physical toil, that like he does with Adam in verse 17. Um, and that he's going to increase or multiply her conceptions or her pregnancies. Because as we said last week, it says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. That word for a conception there is a word that speaks of a child being conceived, not a child being born. And we said that I will multiply your sorrow. The word sorrow there is the word, it's, it's a bone, which refers to toil, which can, it, it refers to anguish or labor or exhausting labor. It's the word that God used uh, when he says to Adam in verse 17, curses the ground for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it. In it's a bone, you shall eat of it. In other words, you are going to eat of this ground. It's going to be physically taxing. This ground is not going to produce for you like it was supposed to. There's a curse on it. And he said, for your sake, and he said, this is going to be your experience all the days of your life. So this word, it's a bone, toil, translated as sorrow in my New King James in verse 16, it really means physical, it can mean physical, well, it can mean pain. It can mean physical pain. It can mean uh, mental, and well, no, the primary words is mental, uh, distress, exhausting toil, worrisome toil. This is the meaning of the word. So we said here that rather than speaking of one thing, when God says, I will multiply your sorrow and your conception, Rather than just speaking of, hey, the woman is going to experience labor pains, he's speaking of two things. Number one, I'm going to multiply your toil, which is what he basically said to, Aaron, to Adam in verse 17. 
I'm going to multiply your toes. So in other words, Eve, like your husband, you're going to be working alongside your husband and you're going to experience the toil of living an agrarian life, of farming the land, of trying to bring forth food from the land. Because as we saw studying Carol Meyer's work, women in ancient Near Eastern cultures, women in agrarian societies in the ancient Near East, Israel would have been a part of that, ancient Israel, Women worked with the men in the field. They didn't just work at home. They were part of the production. Everybody, the entire family would basically work the farm. They would work the land. And it was hard work. So when God says, I will multiply your sorrow and your conception, he's speaking of two things. There's going to be an increase of the toil, of the hardship, of the anguish of working the land. This is what he said to Adam. He's saying this to Eve, and he's going to multiply her conception, meaning he's going to multiply her pregnancies. So we said that her working on the earth with her husband would be toilsome. It would be painful because of the curse. It would be exhausting work. In increasing conceptions or, or pregnancies means that more children would be given to help work the land, thus easing some of the toil and easing some of the exhausting work. Now, as we said last week, go back and watch the whole thing from last week that this was part of the blessing, actually. The increasing of the conception, bringing in more children, as we saw last week, is actually a blessing in, in ancient Hebrew thought. And the idea of children being, more children being um, conceived and brought forth, that God would give them more children, the idea behind that is that the more children you have, they can help you to work the land. And that would ease some of the toil and the exhausting work. We said that, we see this, being alluded to in Genesis chapter 5, verse 29. I'm going to read it, go over there and read again. And this is where uh, it talks about the birth of Noah. So verse, I'll read verse 28. It says, Lamech, uh, Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And he called his son Noah, saying, this one, now notice this, this one will comfort us concerning our work, and the toil of our hands. And by the way, Carol Meyer brings this out. Notice it, it says the work and the toil of our hands. So that's two separate things. It's not that work is bad, but along with the work, it's going to be anxiety filled. It's going to be burdensome. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be uh, anxiety filled, as it were. And we're going to see that in just a few moments. But notice he says that the, when Noah is born, he says, this one will comfort us. The word Noah or Noah in Hebrew means comfort or rest. So this one is going to comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hand because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. So they see the birth of Noah, the child, as being a blessing that would eliminate some of the exhausting work that would give them rest. And so when God says to the woman, Eve, I am going to multiply, and by the way, that's part of what he told her, told the both of them, actually, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 27, he says, be fruitful and multiply. He says, I'm going to multiply your pregnancies. I'm going to bring you, uh, I'm going to increase your pregnancies. This would have been considered a blessing. That part is considered a blessing, not a curse. The part of the judgment, the punishment is, there's also going to be an increase of your toil. Is going to be an increase of the arduous work that you're going to do. Or put it another way, the work will increase in terms of its difficulty, in terms of its of its um, the anxiety you will experience, the hard the, the the hardship you will experience because of your sin. So the difficulty, the arduous work, the anxiety filled labor that they will experience will be because of their sin. But in the midst of this, what God will also do to bring blessing is, I'm also going to multiply you children. So it's like one will offset the other. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So Noah understood his birth as a blessing to help to alleviate the uh, the, the, the pain and the sorrow, the anguish that comes with the toil of the work, all right? So again, the more children, this is the way it was understood in the ancient world, according to Carol Myers, the more children, the more people to work the farm, and thus you ensure survival and thriving. If you've got more children to help you with the work, everybody pitches in, in the ancient Near Eastern world, in the ancient uh, Israelite world, everybody worked the land. Everybody was involved. Everybody had a job to do. It made the work easier, and it would help to ensure survival, the more children that you had. Now, what about, though, the rest of the verse that says, in pain, you shall bring forth children. Now, we're going to look at that. Now, let me say this. 
the reason we're looking at all this and I'm taking my time and going through each line is because we're coming back around and asking the question again, when it says your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you, is God saying, was God teaching as some believe that Eve would have this desire on the inside of her to resist the leadership of her husband and to dominate her husband, to be in charge? Is that what God is saying? And, and so we're looking at this because there are those who, in order to uh, promote the idea and the view that men are to lead over women, part of what some of them teach within the complementarian camp is that women have this desire because of the fall to resist their husband's God-given authority that God established that creation. And she not only resists his authority, but she wants to dominate that dominate him. And that comes from that desire within her. We're going to look, by looking at all this, what, what I'm going to, I'm giving you a little preview here. I don't believe that's what the passage is saying, but we've got to look at all of these verses together and then say, oh, okay, this is what God is communicating. All right. So what about the rest of this verse that says in pain, you shall bring forth children. How does this, how does this relate to interpret and help us to understand the words, your desire should be for your husband and he should rule over you. Is Eve's desire rebellious? Is uh, is it a desire that causes her to, to want to dominate her husband? And therefore, her husband has to dominate her. There, there, there are those who teach that in the camp complementarian uh, viewpoint that the reason the man has to rule is because the woman is going to push against his authority. So therefore, he has to bring her under his authority. And there are those who say, well, that's for her good. There's a small part that says, well, no, we shouldn't follow. Like I said, Wayne Grudem, who is one of the major complementarian voices, believe that this is not the model that should be followed, that the woman has to be uh, ruled over by the husband because she pushes against his authority. He does believe that she's going to push against his authority, but the idea that that well, she pushes against his authority, so that means the man has to exercise authority over her. He sees that as very negative, okay? We're going to talk about that, too, in just a few moments uh, or, or as, as we go through this. Uh, but there are those who believe, no, this is not a negative rule. This is a benevolent rule. God gave the authority and the dominion to man at creation, and so he is just reaffirming his authority and rule, and the woman has to have the authority and rule because he is going to push a, she is going to push against the man's god-given rule and that's to her detriment so god reestablishes reaffirms his rule over the woman so she doesn't get in trouble that's basically the idea okay so we're going to look at this in the next line of genesis chapter 3 verse 16 it says in pain you shall bring forth children and then it says your desire should be for your husband so and he should rule over you in pain uh, you shall bring forth children. The word here, bring forth, and I'm reading the New King James Version, the word bring forth, it is the Hebrew word yalad, yalad. And it does indeed refer to a child being born. It refers to a woman giving, giving birth. There are specific words in Hebrew that deal with the different aspects of uh, of the uh, of the childbirth process, there is a specific word for conceiving. That's the word that we have here in when it says, "I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception." That word is only used to speak of the results of sexual intercourse between a man and a woman. What's the result? A child is conceived. But then there are specific words, as we said last week, that refer to different aspects of the process. And this word here, where it says, "You shall bring forth children," that word specifically. Uh, yalad means to bring forth children. So specifically in the second part, that line, in pain you shall bring forth children, God is specifically talking about the woman giving birth. Now notice he says in pain she will give birth or bring forth children. The Hebrew word here for pain is a seb or a sab. And according to Dr. Carol Myers, this word denotes either mental anguish or work or toil and labor, uh, but not pain, as in basically physically pain. Uh, she said it really focuses on mental anguish, or it focuses on work and toil. Now, I looked at this word in Hebrew, and there is at least one uh, verse of scripture where the word does denote physical pain. In Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 9, it says, he who carries stone is hurt by them, 
and he who splits logs is endangered by them. And the word for hurt here, when it says he who queries, who, you know, he is digging out stones and that's maybe his living, he is hurt by them. In other words, he can, in, in, he can, um, uh, it, he might experience physical pain. He might be hurt by the digging out of rocks and breaking of rocks. It says he can be hurt by them. And this refers to physical pain. So at least one instance in the Hebrew scriptures, it does refer to physical pain, but it appears that this word primarily refers not so much to physical pain. It can refer to that, but it also refers to primarily mental and or spiritual or emotional anguish or discomfort. And this is according to the theological word book of the Old Testament. So this word can refer to primarily mental and or spiritual or emotional anguish or discomfort. Though, and I, and I do believe it, it can refer to pain, even though Dr. Carol Meyer says it denotes either mental anguish or work. But I think she even, no, I think in, in her book, she even says that there might be some pain, some physical pain involved. Okay, so when it says here, in pain, you shall bring forth your children, how should we read this? Should we read it as physical pain, meaning the labor pains that women experience when they go into labor, or is it distress? This is what Carol Meyer says on page 91 of her book, Rediscovering Eve. Because words in parallel poetic lines are not usually synonymous, it likely, talking about the word here, pain, it said, it likely signifies mental anguish rather than the toil or rather than toil or labor. The stress of exhaustion accompanying parenthood. Perhaps hardship would convey that, would convey that both anguish and work accompany parenthood. So in her view, let me read that one more time, because words in parallel poetic lines are not usually synonymous. Now, what she means by that is um, what you have here is poetry. When it says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire should be for your husband. He shall rule over you. The way it's written is that this is a poetic piece. And so you have these lines that are parallel. So I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. The line that parallels that is in pain, you shall bring forth children. And so what she's saying is, especially in Hebrew, parallel poetic lines usually are not synonymous. That, that is that they mean the exactly the same thing. What they tend to do is that they will say something slightly different to amplify what was said before. So, so God says, I will greatly multiply your toil. Remember we said that word there, sorrow, is probably referring to the physical toil that she's going to be engaged in. And then in, so I will greatly uh, multiply your, it's a bone, your toil, your physical work and labor. And in Eseb or Esab, or in mental anguish and hardship, you are going to bring forth children. So in other words, what Mayers is saying, if you can follow me here, she's saying that it's in hardship or mental and emotional anguish that is caused by hardship that the woman is going to give birth. There's going to be hardship. It's not necessarily speaking of the actual labor pains itself. It could be speaking to the hardship the, or excuse me, it could be speaking to the emotional pain and anguish that's caused by the hardship of the life that she's living. So now this fits and this, this fits with and parallels the statement said to Adam in verses 17 and 19. So let me back up for a moment again. So in other words, what God was saying to the woman, and then he said to the man, because of your sin, you guys are going to have it extremely difficult. The ground is not going to be, it's not going to bring forth for you like before. You will be able to work the ground. It will bring forth food for you, but it's going to be hard. It's going to be extremely difficult. It's going to be hard and difficult in such a way that it will cause you anguish. It will cause you physical toil. We know that that was taking place because, again, what we just read in Genesis chapter 5, verse 29, where Lamech says about his son uh, Noah, oh, we have a child who will give us rest from our work and our itzabon, our toil, our anguish, our hardship, right? So again, we're, we're seeing this in Genesis chapter three, that what's speaking here is this hard agrarian, for lack of a better term, farmer's life that they're going to be experiencing. And that in this hard agrarian farmer lifestyle where they're having to work the land, that's no longer producing for them like God intended it to. The, and so you're going to have, uh, is, is going to be a burden, it's going to be arduous, it's going to be hardship. 
in the midst of that, the woman will bring forth children in the midst of this difficulty, in the midst of this difficult farming, this hard agrarian exhaust field lifestyle that they're going to be living, she will bring forth children. Again, we see this in Genesis chapter 5, verse 29. The idea that this is referring to mental and emotional anguish when it says, in pain you shall bring forth children, I see a parallel here in Genesis chapter 17, 18, and 19. Let me explain. So let's go and read Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Then to Adam, God said, because you have he heeded the voice of your wife, and you've eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Notice this. Cursed is the ground for your, for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it. So this is the same word, again, used in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. I will greatly multiply your sorrow, your it's a bone. God says, cursed is the ground for your sake. In it's a bone, you shall eat it all the days of you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So you are going to eat of it, but it's going to come through much hard toil and work. All right. So what he said to Eve, he's saying to Adam. So he's like giving Eve a, a preview of what he was going to say to Adam. Then he says in verse 16, both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth to you. Thorns and thistles are going to complicate the matter of farming, of bringing forth sustenance, of bringing forth a living from the earth. And you shall eat the herb of the field. Now notice God doesn't say it won't happen. He just says it's gonna happen through much hardship, through much difficulty. Then he says this, and in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Now, for years, I read that simply as it's going to be hard work, so Adam's going to sweat. However, uh, again, this is why it's important to be able to go back and study these things in Hebrew, study scholars who have studied these things out. Uh, there is a scholar by the name of, let's see if I can find it here. Yes, a scholar by the name of Sandra Richter. She wrote a book called The Epic of Eden, this book right here which I happen to have, one of my favorite books. If you ever really want a good book that gives you a good introduction to the Old Testament, this is the book that you should read. The Epic of Eden, and this is written by Dr. Sandra Richter, and this is what she says about the phrase, the, you shall eat bread, uh, when it says, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Is it talking about simply Adam working hard and perspiring? No. Now, remember what I said, that in pain you shall bring forth children, that's probably referring to mental and emotional anguish, and that parallels what God said to Adam. This is what Dr. Richter wrote in her book. This is page 111. She said, most read the phrase by the sweat of your face as having to do with difficult physical labor, but an article by Daniel Fleming of New York University has demonstrated that this phrase is actually an old ancient Near Eastern idiom having nothing to do with hard work. Rather, this idiom speaks of anxiety, perspiration inducing fear. Now, let me, let me say this. You said, well, Mike, you said that it was going to be hard. It was going to be difficult. Yes. Is hard work the curse? No. But because of the curse on the earth, the earth would not bring forth like it normally was supposed to, and this would create anxiety. So the toil, the asab, the mental anguish, and the sweat of Adam's face, that um, perspiration-inducing fear, the anxiety, was because of the curse of the earth. She goes on to say, what we find, uh, to, well, let me read. She says, where does anxiety fit into God's curse punish? What we find in Genesis 3 is that because of the rebellion of the earth and the expulsion of Adam and Eve from God's presence, humanity will now live their lives in an adversarial world with a constant gnawing undercurrent of dread that there will not be enough, that their labor, that their labor will not meet their need. That is what it's talking about here. So it's not saying that because Adam has to work hard, he's going to sweat. And so, you know, at the end of the day, oh, I'm tired and I, I got to eat. No, it's saying even though he's laboring, because of the curse of the earth, and, and here's the thing too I want to say. Man was established, man and woman, were given authority over the earth. The earth is no longer yielding to man. God says, curse is the ground for your sake and toil you should eat of it. Uh, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth and you should eat the herb of, and herb of it. The ground is not bringing forth like it did before. And it's interesting, God said, because you ate of the tree, which I commanded you saying you should not eat of it, 
Now the ground is cursed. The ground is now no longer experiencing its natural abundant fullness and fertility and abundance like it had prior to the fall. Now the ground, even though you're to rule over it, it will resist you. The ground, you are the ruler over the earth, but now the earth will be rebelling against your rule. This is what God is saying to the man and the woman, and, he, and it's specifically here to Adam. It's going to resist your rule, but the rule was given to both of them in Genesis chapter one. He said, thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth to you. And because of that, it seemed like you're not going to have enough. That will produce anxiety. Now, for those of us that work, you, you, you know, we people experience that today. We experience anxiety. We experience fear. Am I going to have enough? You know, if you've ever said to yourself, man, there always seems to be uh, more month than money. You know, you come to the end of the month and it's like, oh, I got these, but I've been there, you've been there. And it, 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 even though we don't work the ground, it can produce, it's, it can produce fear. You work hard, you work long, and then you look at like, I still don't have enough. And that can produce anxiety and fear. This is what Adam and Eve was, was being faced with. So when God, so God was saying to Adam, you're going to have this anxiety field fear, this undercurrent of dread that there's not enough. Even though you're working hard and you're trying to plant, and you're trying to bring forth, the ground is resisting you and it'll seem like you're not going to have enough to sustain. This is where the toil, the mental anguish and the mental and emotional pain of anxiety and dread is coming from. So when God says to the woman in because in a seb, in mental anguish, in mental pain, you will bring forth children. It is the pain that comes with being filled with worry that we're not going to have enough. We won't be able to produce enough. We won't be, we won't be able to make it, as so many of us have experienced in our life. She's going to bring forth children in the midst of an experience of life that's filled with dread and fear and pain. She will bring forth the children, but it's going to be within this context. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so this is what we have to keep in mind. That, let me see. Um, we have to keep in mind that we are, that this was originally written to an ancient people. Remember we said that one of the contextual frames is that we have to remember that the Bible while for us was not originally written to us. See, we read this and we immediately apply it to ourselves and we forget the original audience to whom this was spoken to, the original audience who had these writings. The original audience was an agrarian society. The original audience were people who worked the land, who farmed. This would have made sense to them to say, yeah, it's hard trying to make a living off of this land. It is difficult. Ancient, this would have been difficult for ancient Near Eastern people. This would have been the experience across the ancient Near Eastern world that, uh, that the people to whom this was written to lived in. This would have been their common experience. And remember, again, part of the purpose of Genesis is to give an etiology. It is to give an understanding of why are things the way that they are? Why is it so difficult to make a living off the land? Why is it so difficult to get an abundance of crop? Why is it so difficult? Why is it sometimes we have such scarcity and it's so difficult? Ah, now we know from the story of Genesis why. The story of Genesis. Genesis is beginnings. There are sheep, beginnings. The story of beginnings gives us insight as to why we are experiencing these things, why there is toil, why there is anguish, why there is the fear and the anxiety, the mental and emotional distress. Keep in mind that for the original people to whom this was written to, this would explain to them why they are experiencing what they are experiencing, okay? Childbirth to them. And so we can ask the question, what would cause the woman to be anxious? What would cause her to experience uh, mental and emotional anguish when she is conceiving and giving birth. What would cause that? Again, childbirth, and we covered this a little bit last week, childbirth to women in the ancient Near East, in ancient Israel, childbirth to them would be grievous or it would cause mental anguish because, number one, of the high infant mortality rate. Because even though children were born, we're just talking about within the ancient Near East, you had a high infant mortality rate. A lot of children died. So you would have a high infant mortality rate and a high rate of maternal deaths 
where the mother is concerned. So not only did you have a lot of children dying, and then I'm basing this off of the work again of Dr. Carol Mayers, not only did you have a lot of children dying, you also had a lot of mothers, women dying. Can you think of some women in the biblical text who died in childbirth? I think it was Rebecca. I think Rebecca, uh, 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 at one point, was it Rebecca? I think it was Isaac and Rebecca. Yeah, I think it was um, Isaac wife, Rebecca, died in child, childbirth. And you'll hear about, like, you, 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 you hear about uh, Sarah giving birth to uh, Isaac, but then you don't hear about Sarah anymore. Because women could die. Now, she may have died of old age, or she could have died in childbirth and afterwards. My point here, we're not, we're not sure. The, script, the text doesn't actually tell us. But we do see that women do die in childbirth within the biblical text. Uh, the point here is that there was, it was high. high. There was high infant mortality rate. A lot of children didn't make it. And I'll talk about why in just a moment. And there was high maternal mortality rates. A lot of mothers didn't make it. So according to mayors, infants had a 50% survival rate. They had a 50%. It was 50% you might make it, 50% you may not. Mayers also gives insight into the dangers of giving birth both for the baby and the mother. So let me read to you some things from her book, Rediscovering Eve. And this is on uh, starting on page 98. And this is what she says. She says, consequently, with a survival rate of about 50%, having three children survive beyond the age of five would have entailed as many as six pregnancies. Now, this is one of the reasons for wanting a lot of children, because you had a lot of children who would die. So if you had six children, you probably would end up with three as an average. So the more children you have, the, the, more, cho the more children you have, the more children are likely to survive, which again would be considered a blessing, which again, it would help with the farming of the land. OK, which also would be considered a blessing. Again, like I said last week, they didn't look upon a, the children as child labor. It was part of the blessing in in Hebrew theology, Hebrew thinking children are a blessing from the Lord. OK, all right. Let me read this again. Consequently, with a survival rate of about 50 percent, having three children survive beyond the age of five will have entailed as many as six pregnancies or more if preterm losses are included. Estimates for ancient Greece suggest that simply replacing the population would have required every fertile woman to bear six children in order to replace the population. She goes on to say, quote, the more pregnancies a woman had, the greater her own risk of dying, end quote. Let me say that again. The more pregnancies a woman had, the greater her risk of dying. She goes on to say on page 99, lifespans were relatively short compared to those in today's developed world. And unlike today, men generally outlive women, probably because the risk accompanying pregnancy, childbirth, and lactation meant greater female mortality rates. So today we say women tend to outlive men. But in ancient times, men tended to outlive the women. simply and Because again, when you go back to the text, you'll see a lot of men there without their wives some of the main characters, why? Probably they die. And why was that? It was because of the risk of pregnancy, the risk that accompanied pregnancy, the risk that accompanied childbirth, the risk that accompanied lactation. So you had greater female mortality rate. She goes on to say, quote, ancient populations had virtually no way to deal with the complications of labor and delivery. In other words, they didn't have the modern uh, technology, the modern medical technology and knowledge that we have today. Consider the grim situation in early modern uh, Europe. So she talks about in early modern Europe, what happened? A whole variety of conditions, such as hemorrhage, pelvic deformity, disproportion between the, size, the sizes of a child's head and the pelvis, severe abno abnormal presentations, such as transverse, tra transverse lies, uh, eclampsia, and uterine inertia in labor, are likely to have posed problems which were beyond the capacities of those attending the birth to alleviate. Now, this was in early modern U uh, Europe that people experienced this. And even then, people didn't know how to deal with all of these complications. She goes on to say, quote, ancient Greek women were subject to these common complications, which would have affected Israelite women too. Even if delivery proceeded smoothly, mothers and their newborns were, partic were particularly susceptible to infections that were often fatal. 
for the ancients had no concept of pathogens and the need for sanitation. So they didn't know about germs, but they would be subject to all of that. In addition, inadequate nutrition in pregnant and lactate, lactate, lactating women increased their vulnerability to infection and disease. One more factor, so, so let me say right here again, these are the reasons that I'm giving you why women would be anxious, why they would be in anguish. It's because of all of these complications that would arise with giving birth. So now we know why in pain, in mental anguish, you shall give birth. Goes on to say, one more factor was the mother's age. Young mothers are at greater risk for childbirth difficulties and death than our older ones today. So we know that after a certain age, if you are female, you, have, you seek to have children, the older you get, the more at risk it puts you. But women, what she's saying is women in ancient Israelite times and in the ancient Near East, they were at more risk, younger women were at more risk than older women today. Uh, let's see. Um, she goes on to say, I'll read this. She said, a recent UN publication reports that complications of pregnancy and childbirth are a leading cause of teen deaths in Latin, in Latin America, for example. Or excuse me, in Latin America, for example, pregnant girls under 16 are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth than women in their 20s. She goes on to say, quote, although there is no direct evidence about the average age of marriage in ancient Israel, Information from later periods and from elsewhere in the ancient world suggests that girls married in their mid or even early teens. Even if young teenage mothers survive, even if young teenage mothers survive childbirth, their offsprings often have low birth weight and other problems causing illness and sometimes death. She, then she says one more thing. This is from page uh, 100. Quote, awareness a frequent infant and maternal deaths meant a general apprehension of losing one's newborn or succumbing to the risk of childbirth. So when we ask the question, what is the cause, when God says in pain, if we translate that as in mental and emotional anguish, you will bring forth children, what would be the cause of that mental and emotional distress, that mental and emotional anguish. The cause of it would be, according to Myers, is that uh, is, is because of the dangers of giving birth both to the, the child, the, the newborn, and to the mother itself. It was just fraught with dangers in the ancient world, but it was part of life. They didn't have the, med the, the modern medical technology that we have today. This is, again, why I say it's important for us to go back. And this opened my eyes when I read this probably about over a year ago when I got the book, and I went, Huh, I never considered that because, you know, we live in our own world and we think, oh, we know, having a baby. Yeah, there's complications sometimes, but we got medical science. Uh, you can always do a C-section. You know, uh, the baby is breached. You just do a C-section uh, and you can take the baby out. Uh, and, you know, we got all these medical technologies now. They didn't have these things back then. So you could imagine that there was the possibility of death hanging over women whenever they conceived and when they were about to give birth. They knew it was a reality. They probably had seen people die, babies die. So there is this anguish. There is this fear leading up to the birth and probably even accompanying the birth. And of course, there, there are labor pains. There's pains that you're experiencing and that probably heightened the mental and emotional anxiety also, all right? So regardless of how we interpret it's a bone and a set, whether we say, well, it's labor pains, Mike, or whether we say it's mental and emotional. I think it's mental and emotional, just like Carol Mayer says, she gives really good evidence and what I believe to be very plausible and strong evidence that this is not talking about when God says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and pain you shall bring forth. It's not talking about the physical labor pains. It's talking about number one, the physical labor that men, that, that women will experience with their husbands as they work side by side with their husbands to work the land and bring forth food for their survival. And it's talking about the mental and emotional distress that comes from uh, knowing that I could die or my child could die as I'm bringing forth the child, okay? So regardless of how we interpret Isabon and Aseb as either physical pain or mental and emotional anguish, here's the main idea. 
The main idea is that Eve or women will conceive and bear children in the midst of great difficulty, anguish, and hardship. That's the main idea. Even if you want to say, uh, Mike, I think it's I think it's physical pain and, and labor. And there are some scholars who do. I think, again, Carol Mayers and Joy Fleming give excellent reasons why it is probably not that. I wouldn't die on the heel for this, but I think it's the right way to interpret it. And when you start, we're going to bring it all together in a second, and it's going to make sense of your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you, especially your desire shall be for your husband. When you take all of this into to consideration, uh, childbirth would have been seen as grievous. It would have been seen, uh, well, let me, let me back up. Uh, whether it's due to the difficulty of making a living and surviving doing uh, and surviving that's due to the curse of the earth and the physical the physical exhaustion that that brings you know they have to work the land early in the morning to probably late in the evening in the hot sun they got to work the land that brings a lot of physical exertion and exhaustion uh, whether it's due to the anxiety and the fear of death of the child or the mother which was very real and it was a part of every pregnancy or even if it was because of the actual physical labor pains that a woman will experience when in labor and when giving birth, again, the main idea, it, it, let me say this, it could be all three of those together. The main idea is that there's going to be difficulty. There's going to be anguish along with the blessing and the conceiving and the giving of birth of a child. Uh, the the, the um, one area where I have some slight disagreement with Carol Mayers is that she said that women would be hesitant and they would not want to uh, be with their husbands um, to have children with them, again, because of all of these hardships, because of all these difficulties and complications. And another scholar, whose name I don't remember right now, but I was reading it this morning, she said, well, when we look at the Hebrew text, we don't see that. We don't see any woman saying, I don't want to have any kids. Oh, no, no, thank you. I do not want to have any children. We see them wanting children. We see them wanting to bear children. Matter of fact, they are sorrowful. They are sad, even depressed, if they can't have children, because children would give a woman honor. To have children, especially if you have boys, it would give you honor. However, I do agree with Carol Mayers that it would create anxiety and dread because of all of the complications. And of course, this woman, she works the field because women would work, they would have their children, and you still got to work. You still got to go out there. You got to help your husband. You got to take in the food that he brings in, and you've got, you've got to make a meal out of it. We're going to be talking about that probably next week. So there would be physical exhaustion, as we see in Genesis chapter 5, verse 9. There would be physical exhaustion, but there also would be this dread. There would be this fear of, am I going to live or am I going to die? Is my baby going to live or is my baby going to die? That is what they will experience. So all of this together makes for a difficult, anguished, pain-filled, fearful bringing forth of children. That's the pain that I believe God is speaking of here when he says, in pain, you shall bring forth children. It's not the necessarily just the physical labor pain, but it's the anguish. It's the anxiety. It's the fear, the dread that's caused by all of the complications of pregnancy and of the hard, difficult agrarian farming life. Does that make sense? And again, when you look at this within its cultural context, you see that this is very, very, very possible because it's also true that this is what people experienced, the women experienced back then. Okay, so again, the main idea here, regardless of how you translate or think about pain, is that children will be brought forth in great difficulty, and they, they will be conceived in great difficulty, they will be brought forth with great difficulty. I think the word pain there is referring to, uh, the isabon is referring to the physical exhausting toil, and isab is referring to the mental and emotional anguish that comes from the fear of what could, of the bad things that could happen when conceived or when bringing forth. All right, now, with that in mind, you gotta keep that in mind as we continue to go down. The desire of the woman and the husband ruling over her. What is that talking about? As stated before, many see this portion as referring to a rebellious desire on the part of the woman that she's gonna resist the leadership of her husband and then she's gonna seek to dominate and control her husband, that she's gonna to seek to be in charge. So therefore, he must rule over her. Many people see it this way. There are even some egalitarian scholars who see it this way based upon Susan Foe's work, who we referred to uh, in last session and in the se session 11, session 10. So go to session 10 and 11. Though egalitarians who see it, they see it as 
the woman's desire and the man's ruling as conflict between the sexes. They see it as negative for both of them, not just for the women. Many complementarians see the man rule as positive, the woman's desire is negative. Compliment, uh, egalitarians will say, well, if that's the case, that she does have this desire, not only is that negative, but so is the man's desire to rule. And so what you have here is conflict, conflict between the sexes. So that's how some people look at it, but there's differences in how egalitarians versus complementarians see it. Complementarians will see it as the woman desire is negative, the man's uh, rule is positive. It's for the benefit of the woman, basically to keep her uh, under his leadership and under his rule so that things will function the way God says that they're to function. They see it as a positive. Here's the thing. Often this word, uh, often the, the use of the word desire in Genesis chapter four, verse seven is used to interpret the same word in Genesis 3.16. Now we've talked about this before. Let's go over it. In Genesis chapter four, verse seven, God's talking to Cain. In verse seven, he says to Cain, because Cain is upset. God says to Cain in verse seven, uh, I'll, I'll start with verse six. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you shall rule over it. So many people see that because it, it uses the word desire, the word desire that's used here, teshukah, is the same word that's used in Genesis chapter three, verse 16, when it says, your desire shall be for your husband. It's the same word in Hebrew. So therefore, uh, they, 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 they will use Genesis chapter four, verse seven to interpret it, Genesis 3, 16. This is the basis of Susan Foles' work. She said, if we wanna understand what the desire for your husband means, we've gotta look at Genesis chapter four, verse seven, see what desire means there, and that will tell us how to interpret Genesis chapter three, verse 16. The idea is, and the argument is, Genesis 4, 7, well, I'm gonna put it like this, Genesis 3, 16 is not very clear in what it means. Genesis 4, 7 is clear, and the, and the, the way most uh, biblical, interpreta uh, biblical hermeneutics and interpretation works is, we're gonna use a clear passage to interpret a passage that is not so clear or that's less clear. That's a basic general interpretive rule. You interpret passages that are not very clear by passages that are much clearer. So Genesis 4, 7 is seen as a clear passage. Here we understand, it says, sin lies at your door, its desire is for you, uh, and you should rule over it. Mike, that's very clear. Sin desires to possess Cain, it desires to rule over Cain, but he must rule over it. Therefore, in Genesis 3.16, when it says the woman's desire, your desire shall be for your husband, it must mean she wants to dominate him like sin wants to dominate and control Cain. That is how this is argued. But there are some problems with using Genesis 4.7, and this is pointed out by several scholars, one of whom is named Jason Jansen C. Condren. So I'm gonna bring up a slide because I don't want to have to try to go back and forth with reading his article. So I put together a slide presentation. It's very basic. It's not pretty. Now, if my wife had put this together, she would have made it very pretty. Uh, but I'm going to uh, use this slide presentation, and hopefully everybody can see this. Okay, there we go. Okay, so uh, let me start to the beginning here. So he wrote this article called Toward a Purge of the Battle of the Sexes, a Return for the Original Meaning of Genesis 316b. By the way, you can actually find this online. Okay, you can find this online. Yeah, there I am. You can find this online. You can actually read it. Just type in toward a purge of the battle of the sexes and, and return for the original meaning of Genesis chapter 3, verse 16b. Okay. Now, let me read to you what he says this is about. Susan T. Foles, Susan T. Fole argues the woman's desire, that, that Hebrew word there is teshukah, desire, in Genesis 3.16 is not an affectionate desire for her husband, as in almost all previous English translations, but rather a desire to contend with him for leadership. This adversarial view has gained wide acceptance among evangelicals, as can be seen by its appearance in the New Living Translation and the 2016 ESV, the English Standard Version, which had a lot of complementarians on its uh, translation committee. The, pre this, the present essay, his, his article here, contends the view is seriously misguided. Its reliance on Genesis 4-7, a text with its own major difficulties, makes for an unreliable foundation. 
Furthermore, an examination of the history of translation and interpretation of Teshukah in its three Old Testament occurrences, as well as its uses outside the Old Testament in the Dead Sea Scroll, that's what DSS stands for, reveals both a complete lack of precedent for an adversarial reading, as well as considerable evidence that the original meaning was not desire, but rather return. That's a mouthful. We'll explain it as we go. What he's basically going to show is Susan T's argument, Susan T. Foles' argument, that this should be that desire should be seen as the woman contending with the man for the leadership position that she's going to try to dominate him. He goes, that's a wrong way to think about it. To use Genesis chapter four, verse seven to argue that point is also wrong because of the difficulties with Genesis chapter four, verse seven. Okay, so uh, let me read, let me go on here. Let me see, make sure. Um, um, so um, let me go to some more PowerPoints here. Uh, why is it not working? Okay, there we go. So problems with unit, this is from the article, problems with using Genesis 4-7 as an interpretive key. And I just copied and pasted some things to a PowerPoint. He says, Foe's strongest argument in favor of the adversarial view that the woman wants to rule over the man and the one consistently cited by proponents, mostly complementarians, though there are some egalitarian scholars who also hold this view, is, is that it accounts best for the adversarial use of sin, of sins, uh, teshuka or desire in Genesis 4-7. Uh, indeed, with only minor variations, the language and the syntax of the two passages is identical. Now, I've shared that with you before. When you put these two passages together side by side in Hebrew, they look almost exactly the same. And this is one of the reasons people will argue and say, see, this Genesis chapter 4, verse 7 gives us the proper interpretation. Sin's desire is to rule over Cain. Therefore, the woman's desire is to rule over the man. We base that upon the fact that when you look at the, the grammatical structure, it is practically the same. But let's read some more things here. He goes on to say, unfortunately, the problems with using Genesis 4, 7 as an interpretive key are seldom recognized. And by the way, this article was written in 2017, so it's about five years old. He says, most significantly, what Hamilton, who's another Old Testament scholar, what he describes as the clear meaning of Genesis 4-7 is actually not so clear at all. According to, uh, let's see, hang on just a second here. He's, he goes on to say, uh, yeah, he goes on to say, according to Umberto Casuto, uh, Kusuto, who is an Old Testament scholar, Jewish scholar, I believe he's a Jewish scholar. Uh, according to Umberto Casuto, Genesis 4-7 is one of the most difficult and obscure biblical sentences. Claus Westerman, another Old Testament scholar, highly respected, sees 4-7b as a sentence which is incomprehensible. And Otto Prosik goes so far as to call Genesis 4-7 the most difficult verse in Genesis. So remember I said to you before, one of the interpretive rules is you take a passage, we have a passage that's not clear as to what it means, you go to another passage that is clear and you use it to interpret the unclear passage. What most people and most of us have done is read Genesis 4-7 and said, well, it's clear. There are scholars who say, no, it's not. We got what it, we got um, three of them here along with others, if you go and read the article, he gives a list of others who said this passage is really not clear. And Otto Prosik, uh, Pro Proxic says it is the most difficult verse in Genesis. Claus Westerman, a sentence which is incomprehensible. In Bro in, in, uh, Umberto Casuto, one of the most difficult and obscure biblical sentences. According to these Old Testament scholars, this is not as clear as we have been often led to believe, or as we've been told. Let me go on. So why is this passage so difficult? Let me give you, again, some of the reasons that Jensen C. Condren gives. He says, quote, the most popular interpretation of 4-7 today is that sin, in Genesis 4-7, is portrayed as a beastly demon that is crouching, the Hebrew term is rabatz, is crouching at Cain's door. It has a desire to devour Cain and Cain must rule over it. Wester, Westerman, 
Old Testament scholar, criticizes this view, however, arguing that an introduction of sin personified as a beast or door demon lies completely outside the admonitory or warning style of verses six and seven, and that there exists no comparable imagery anywhere in the Old Testament. Joaquin uh, Azevedo goes so far as to say that the Pentateuch does not allow the interpretation of Rabat as a demon. So there are some scholars who say that this is referring to a beastly demon. He's crouching at the door. Westerman Azevedo says, no, there is no way you can get that from the Old Testament text. There is no other imagery like this comparable to anywhere else in the Old Testament. And Azevedo says the Pentateuch, just, the Pentateuch does not allow the interpretation of Rabat as a demon. So, and this has been a popular interpretation in some in some places. They said, nope, you can't do that. All right, what, why else was it difficult? This is another reason for the difficulty. Now, this is gonna begin into some of the grammar. I don't expect you to understand all of this talk about the Hebrew grammar, but it is to illustrate a point. So let me read what it says, and then I'll give some commentary, okay. Perhaps the most significant problem, however, is grammatical. Remember I said that one of the contextual frames is the literary, we have to look at the linguistics, we have to look at the language. Remember I said that? You go back to the first three lessons, I talk about the contextual frames. One of them is you have to look at it linguistically. Perhaps the most, perhaps the quote, perhaps the most significant problem, however, is grammatical. The feminine noun for sin, which is hetet uh, at, lacks agreement with the masculine participle rabats, as well as with the masculine pronominal suffix on uh, teshuka, its or his desire, and you must rule over him, okay? Uh, which is, has to do with the Hebrew word mashal. And you say, Mike, what are you talking about? Okay, so he, Hebrew, like Greek, you can have what we call gender forms of the words. Some words are feminine in gender, some words are masculine in gender. Normally, if you have a word that's feminine, you want to, the word that follows it, that has to do with it, also needs to be feminine. Or if a word is masculine, often the word that follows it in the sentence or in the passage that has to do with that word, it needs to be masculine too. What the scholars have recognized is you've got a feminine word here, chetat at, but it lacks agreement with the masculine participle. In other words, you got a feminine word, but then you got a masculine participle that doesn't fit the rules of the grammar. So that's a problem. And he says, uh, uh, as, uh, Azevedo resolves the gender agreement problem with Rabats by arguing that the feminine subject, uh, the feminine subject, uh, hetat at, the, the word for sin, is not a reference to sin, but to the more common use of the word for a sin offering. So hetat at can be used for a sin offering. Now, if this is so, the male animal used for the sin offering can become the subject of the masculine rabats. In other words, if even though the feminine word for sin is, the, uh, uh, excuse me, even though the word for sin in Hebrew, chetet at, is feminine, if it's not talking about sin, but it's talking about the sin offering, which is always a male animal, that would fit with the masculine participle. You, you see? Well, if it's a male animal, then it goes with the masculine participle of it. Of, of sin uh, of the rabats. Rabats is, is masculine. Um, his desire, also masculine, all of that would fit together. The rules are being kept in, all right? So he says, uh, uh, let's see, chetat uh, at is not a reference to sin, but to the more common use of the word for a sin offering. If so, the male animal used for the sin offering can become the subject of the masculine rabats. This interpretation, in fact, has been especially prop popular in previous centuries. So in previous centuries, this is the way Old Testament scholars interpreted the text, that it was not referring to sin, but it was referring to a sin offering, which was a male animal. He says, as for the masculine su suffixes, the L-O-X slash O-G, that's the Septuagint and Old Greek, it views able, so the, Septu the, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it views able, not sin, as the antecedent. Interpreters such as Ibn Ezra and Calvin held variations on this view, 
and it continues to be advanced today. In other words, when it talks about his desires for you, they're saying it wasn't talking about sin because that because sin is referring to the sin offering is actually referring to Abel. Now you may go, what? But yeah, and this was held as an interpretation for centuries. Another scholar by the name of Michael Morales, after a survey of the previous narr narrative contrast between Cain and Abel, he observes it would be quite odd for this pair to be replaced by that of Cain and personified sin. In other words, when you read the text, it's talking about Cain and Abel, talking about Cain and Abel. Then all of a sudden it switches and talks about Cain and sin. He said, that's odd. When before it's been contrasting Cain and Abel, and all of a sudden it switches to Cain and personified sin. He concludes that Abel, not per personified sin, is most likely the person being referred to in verse seven. When it says his desire is for you, it's not talking about sin based upon the Hebrew, based upon the contrastive narrative, it's not talking about sin. It's talking about Abel. What would be Abel's desire? One, trans, one interpretation says it would be Abel's desire for Cain's birthright, that, Cain, that Abel had a desire to be uh, to have the, first, the, the birthright of the firstborn, okay? Because Cain was the firstborn. That's one, that's one interpretation. It's not the only one, but that's one interpretation, okay? But he, here's my point. I read all of that. You go like, oh my God, this is so complicated. Exactly, exactly. This text is not as clear in the Hebrew as it appears in English. Understand every time someone translates the Bible from Hebrew into English or Greek into English, they, the, the, the translation is also an interpretation. You have to decide, and, and most biblical scholars will tell you that. They will say, yeah, it's, you have to decide how do we interpret the word this way or do we interpret the word this way? If we interpret it this way, it's gonna change the meaning of the text. If we change it this way, if we interpret it this way, if we use this word, that will change the meaning of the text. All translations are interpretations. That's not bad. Whenever you go from one language to another, you have to make interpretive decisions because words don't always fit one-to-one. -one. So you have to make interpretive decisions. Um, I remember one time uh, hearing, well, I won't get into that because um, <laughs> I have time to check it out. I, don't, I, have to have to, I would have to go back and make sure it's true. And I like to say things that are true, all right? So the point here, you read all this, you go like, oh my God, this is so complicated. Exactly. Genesis 4-7 has often been used as, in, in terms of saying, this is the clearer text. We're going to use it to interpret the less clear text, Genesis 3-16. When you get into the Hebrew, you find out <laughs> Genesis 4-7 is not that clear. There's a lot of interpretive problems, a lot of grammatical problems with Genesis 4-7. As a matter of fact, this is what uh, Jansen C. Condren says, my point here is not to defend any one position on, on Genesis 4-7, but to insist it is not the rock-solid interpretive key to Genesis 3-16 that, is, that it is often made out to be. According to Westerman, Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, can, quote, only be made use of with caution to explain the Cain and Abel narrative if used at all. Interpreters would do well to heed similar caution when it comes to using Genesis 4, verse 7 to explain Genesis 3.16. Indeed, the fact that Genesis 4.7 is an indispensable interpretive key for the adversarial view, the view of so Susan Foe and others, the fact that it is an indispensable interpretive key for the adversarial view exposes this view as based on the most precarious of foundations. In other words, it's not a good idea to use this verse. So the idea again, that Genesis 4-7 is the clearer passage by which to interpret it, Genesis 3-16, and that desire is being interpreted as adversarial or rebellious on the part of the woman, this has several problems. And Condren suggests that Genesis 4-7 should not even be used in this way, because Genesis 4-7 itself is not clear. Genesis 4-7 itself has interpretive problems. So it cannot be used as the clearer text because it has a lot of unclarity itself. All right? So that's what I wanted to share with you um, where this is concerned. So let me, I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment here and go, and go back. Okay, so how should we look at 
Genesis 3.16. I'm in agreement with the scholars who said you can't be based upon the evidence. The evidence says this verse is not clear in Genesis 4.7. It's not clear that it should even be interpreted this way. Just because something has been interpreted, uh, interpreted a certain way for many years, and just because you've read it that way for many years, doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it's accurate. It doesn't mean that it is correct. Hang on, things are popping up on my screen here. Okay, so we have to look at the evidence. I try and I seek to be persuaded by the evidence, the historical evidence, the cultural evidence, the linguistic evidence. Now, all the time, it's not going to be 100%, but you have to look at, the, in other words, 100% certainty that, yes, this absolutely proves it. You have to look at the preponderance of evidence and go, hey, the preponderance, the weight of the evidence points in this direction, not that direction. In other words, the preponderance of the evidence where Genesis chapter 4, verse 7 does not point to we should use it to define the desire in Genesis 3.16 as being rebellious. The woman's re desire is rebellious against the man, or a woman's desire in general are rebellious against men, and women are trying to dominate based upon Genesis 4.7. The preponderance of the evidence says, no, you can't interpret it that way, because Genesis 4.7 is not as clear as we would like for it to be. And so the, uh, the interpretive tool that says a clear text should interpret a less clear text would not apply to Genesis 4-7 because there are problems with the grammatical structure. There are problems with the interpretation of Genesis 4-7. Now, if somebody says, no, I think it should be clear. You've got to prove that. You just can't make an assertion. You just can't say, well, I don't agree with that. I think Genesis 4-7 is clear. What's your evidence? Now, I'm, and I know I'm talking in a little bit scholarly way here, but what's your evidence? Because I hear people make assertions all the time. They go, no, I don't agree with that. That's not true. Fine. What's your evidence? When I used to teach Bible school, I used to say this to the students all the time. I go, you can disagree with me all you want. And I invite your disagreement. If my friend John Deese is watching, John had went to school, he know I would tell him that. You can disagree all you want, but you've got to come with evidence. You just can't say, well, this is what I believe. Why do you believe that? And you couldn't tell me because this is what my grandmother believed. My grandmama taught me this. No, I wouldn't accept that. You've got to give me evidence. You've got to give me facts as to why you believe that. And this is what I taught all the students. Why I taught them, I said, this class, more than anything else, is to make you think. And even here, I want you to think. I want you to think about the text. So the preponderance of the evidence points to the fact that we can't use Genesis 4, 7. Now, if somebody comes to me and, and gives me evidence to the contrary and says, hey, here's some more evidence that proves this is the way that we have it in our Bibles now that it should be uh, interpreted, I'm going to follow the evidence. That's the way I was trained. That's the way I was taught by all my teachers and my instructors, my professors. We have to follow the evidence. The evidence at this point says there is a problem with using Genesis 4-7 to interpret Genesis 3-16 as a woman having a rebellious desire to control and dominate her husband, or women have, have a, dom a, a wrong desire to dominate men. It cannot be interpreted that way. So let me close real quick here. How should we understand desire in Genesis 3-16? How should we understand it? Condren gives strong evidence from several different sources as to how we should interpret it. He, he looks at the Septuagint in the Old Greek, which is about a third century uh, three, uh, BCE work. It's about 300 years before Christ. This is the Hebrew Bible translated into Greek using Old Greek. He uses this as one of his sources, the Syriac Peshitta, which is the accepted Bible of Syrian Christians. This is composed around the first through the second century, and it became their accepted Bible from the third century on. He uses that text. He uses the book of Jubilees, which is an intertestamental book from the second century BCE, so about 200 years before Jesus. Uh, he looks at this book for how we should interpret uh, Teshuka, desire, in Genesis 3. And also he looks at Philo, who's a first century um, author and, and a philosopher. He was a contemporary of Paul. He wrote, utilizing this word, and there's a lot of other resources. Go and read the article. I didn't want to take time to go through all of it because I'd be here for three hours. But if you go and look at all of the sources he gives, he gives a very plausible and what I, I would say strong case that this word here, teshuka, should be translated as return, not just simply desire. Uh, because all of these sources, all of the sources that I just quoted to you, that's how they interpret it. Genesis 3.16, and that's how they 
translated or interpreted the word teshuka. They translated it as return. So the Septuagint, the Syriac Peshitta, the Book of Jubilees, these are all before the time of uh, Christ or during the time of Christ, Philo and other sources in the article, some later, they interpreted the word desire as return. This is how they understood Genesis 3.16. He shows them, he even shows in the article that later rabbinic interpretation, later rabbinic midrash on this verse interprets the word teshukah as a wordplay, uh, excuse me, it, it interprets it as return, desire as return, and they use a wordplay. The rabbis would use wordplays a lot in order to interpret text. So let me go back to my screen again. I'm going to uh, bring it up. I want to show you what the rabbi said. Okay, uh, let's see where are we at here. Let me enlarge this. Okay. He says, in a further paragraph, Genesis Rabbah uses another wordplay. The Genesis Rabbah is a rabbinic work, uses another wordplay to associate teshuka, understood as desire, with return. And the Hebrew word here is shuv. So they use the wordplay to associate desire with return. This is what the quote says. When a woman sits down on the birth stool, she says, and this is a little humorous, I shall never again have sexual relations with my husband. Why? She's in anguish. She's in pain. Then the Holy One, blessed be he, said to her, says to her, you will return to your desire. You shall, hash, uh, uh, I think it's hashuvi, or hashuv, hashuvi, uh, le teshuka. You, shall, you will return, shuv, to your desire, teshuka. That is, you will return to having desire for your husband. This is how the rabbis interpreted later rabbis, Genesis Rabbah, it's a later rabbinic work. As if it's, I, I think it's an early rabbinic work, but um, they, this is how it was, what I'm trying to say, this is how the rabbis saw it. So they saw, they associated desire, teshuka, with return, shu. From shu, we get the word teshuva, which is repentance, to turn from your sin and turn back to God. Well, the rabbi said, your, uh, uh, they associate teshuka, desire, with return. So let me read it again. When a woman sits down on the birth school, she's uncomfortable, she's in pain, she's trying to give this birth to this child. She says, I shall never again have sexual relations with my husband. Then the Holy One, blessed be he, says to her, you will return to your desire. That is, you will return to having desire for your husband, okay? So this is how this term should be understood. So he shows that this is one of the ways it could be interpreted. So when we put all of this together, I think I have one more verse you see. Yeah, let me read what scholar, this is another scholar, Joel N. Lore. He uh, is quoted by, uh, um, he's quoted in this article, and he reasons that, that Genesis Rabbah, this may be an ingenious way of explaining what Teshuka is what desire is, its meaning being inextricably linked with the idea of returning. So this scholar, Joel Lohr says, or Lear, Lohr, Lohr, Lear, uh, we'll say Lohr, he says, this could be an ingenious way by the rabbis of explaining what that word desire means. They link it with the idea of returning. So at a minimum, the rabbis appear to recognize two interpretive traditions, one favoring return and the other desire. It is worth speculating whether or not they recognize the return tradition as the older and more established of the two, but this would go beyond the evidence. So we don't know for certain how the rabbis saw this. Let me stop sharing now, go back. Okay, so I'm back. All right, so when we put all this together, all right, that desire could mean return. What do we learn? We put together this, the, the, the language, we put together what we know about the culture and the, the sociological uh, uh, experience of the people. Here's what I believe God is saying to us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 to the woman Eve. When you put all the get, when you put all when you put it all together, it clarifies it. The woman with her husband is going to face hardship. She's going to face exhausting toil, anguish, and anxiety because of the hard agrarian life that they will live. And even though she's going to face all of this, plus the dangers and mental and physical anguish and pain of childbirth, yet even with all of that she will still desire or she will still return to her husband with affection and devotion remember in one of the in in uh, lesson 
10, we talked about the work of, of a Hebraist scholar, Andrew McIntosh, where he sees Teshuka as meaning to be devoted to your husband, okay? To have concentrated focus, attention, or devotion to your husband. So I'm saying here, when we put all this together, the woman with her husband is gonna face hardship, exhausting toil, anguish and anxiety because of the hard agrarian farm life that they will be living. And even though she's gonna face all of that and she's gonna to have to deal with the dangers and the mental and emotional anguish and pain of childbirth, yet with all of this hardship, all of this anguish, she still is gonna desire and return to her husband with affection and devotion. And what will that result in? Conception of children. She's gonna return back to her husband even though she faces all this anxiety, even though she faces all this exhausting toil, even though she faces the danger of death of her children when she's giving birth and her own death, yet when it's all over, like the rabbis have said, you will turn again to your husband. You will desire him again. You will turn back to him, I would say, with devotion and affection, which will re again result, Lord willing, if that's the desire, and, and among Israelite women, it seemed to be, it will result in more in pregnancies, which fulfills what God said, I will multiply your conception. But you can't multiply conception if people don't come back together. So even though there's a lot of anguish, there's a lot of pain, mental and emotionally, pain from the physical toil, yet this woman will return again and again to her husband, not as a curse. This is not a curse. This is the, what, what the curse is, or what I should say, not curse, what the judgment is, is the anguish. It's the hardship. It's the anxiety. Giving birth and desiring a husband is natural and normal. That's the good thing. That's the blessing. The other one, the anguish, the anxiety, that is the curse. That was in part of God's original intent. So the idea here is that despite the dangers, despite the hardships, despite the mental and emotional, physical pain and anguish, the woman will return to her husband out of devotion to him and out of a desire for intimacy and connection with him. She is not seeking out of some corrupted desire to usurp his authority and dominate him. That is not the point that's being made. When you put this all together, you get a different picture. When we set this verse back in its sociological context of the ancient Israelites and ancient Near Eastern culture, we get a clear picture of what is being said and being communicated. Again, I believe what God is saying here, based upon the research of all of the scholars that I've quoted to you, is that I am, am going to multiply the toil and the physical exertion that you and your husband will experience. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, that's judgment because of your sinning against me, eating of the fruit. But I'm also going to multiply your pregnancies. I will give you multiple children because there is danger of children dying. So I'm gonna give you multiple children who will be a blessing to you, who will help you to farm the land and who will give you some rest from that toil. And even though you experience Eve, all and another woman following, even though you experience all of this hardship and all of this mental and emotional and physical toil and anguish, yet you will find yourself still desiring to connect with your husband, to be intimate, to be affectionate, to be devoted to him, which continues the process. This is what's being said. When we set it back in its sociological context of the ancient Near East and of the ancient Israelites, this becomes much clearer. We get a better and we get a clearer picture of what God is saying and what, God, and what is being communicated. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Let me quote to you again from Taryn Williams in a book that I quoted from before called How God Sees Women. And we're almost done here. Taryn Williams, in his book, How God Sees Women, this is on page 77, he talks about the, the desire of the woman as a God-given desire. I fully agree with him 100%. Um, and when I first read his book, he enlightened me to something I didn't see. Since gathering all this information together, I believe it's true even more. He said, the God-given desire of you sees Eve's desire for her man, not as sinful, but as natural. I agree. The immediate context of judgment the immediate context of judgments in verse 16 through 19 suggests it is a natural desire, albeit a frustrated one. The woman brings children into the world, something natural. But because of the fall, she now experiences terrible pain. And my view is that the pain is not necessarily just the labor pains, but it's the pain of the agrarian lifestyle and the mental and uh, emotional anguish 
of concern, are we gonna have enough? Are we gonna be able to make it? Okay. Uh, similarly, the, similarly, the man desired to draw food from the soil, but it, is, but it now obstructs him. Finally, the man whose life is sustained by the land or will eventually be swallowed up in death as a return to its dust. In each of these judgments, a God-given desire has been derailed. Along the same lines as the other judgments then, her desire for her husband as her equal partner is natural, but unfortunately it is thwarted by his desire to rule her. Let me give this to you in my own words and from my own perspective. In Genesis chapter three, verse 16 through 19, what we see is something positive that God originally said, now being tainted by something negative, the judgments because of sin. So here's the positive. Genesis chapter one, verse 26 and 20 through 28, God says, be fruitful and multiply. That's the positive. Here's the negative. The, um, it will, your, your multiplication, your consumption of children will be accompanied by anguish, fear, anxiety, and pain of mind and body. That's the negative. You got the positive, be fruitful and multiply. But now because of sin, the negative is entered in. The, the conception and the bringing forth of children will be accompanied by anguish, fear, anxiety, and pain. Here's another positive. God tells Adam, and by proxy Eve, keep and tend the garden. That's your job. That's a positive. Here's the negative. Now the ground will not yield to you as before. It is cursed because of you. Labor will now be anxiety-filled and exhausting. So you got the positive. Tend the ground. The negative, it's not going to yield to you as before, and you're going to find it to be a worry and anxiety. Here's the positive. God says in, to man and woman, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, rule over my creation. He says this to both of them. Rule over my creation and have dominion over it. Now we have a negative introduced. He says to the woman, your husband will rule over you, though you will desire and be devoted to him. What happens? What's the negative? The joint rule that they had has been altered now. The joint rule has been altered. They both were commissioned in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28 to rule over the earth. Now something has been introduced that was not there before. And I've done a whole message on this about Genesis 1 and 2 does not establish that man was given the rule at creation. All of the complementarian arguments for that, we've dealt with that. Go back. You can listen to the messages on that. Now, another, uh, another type of rule has been entered in that was not part of God's original design. Now, let me say this. Every positive that we see is a, has been offset and altered by the introduction of a negative. So here's the thing I want you to know. Rule, when God says your husband will rule over you, by itself does not inherently mean a bad rule. The word therefore rule is mashah. doesn't mean a bad rule. It could be used of someone who rules badly. But it can also be rule, be used of someone who's ruling something positively. Is used of self-control, the man who rules over his own spirit. That's a positive, okay? But it's also used of the oppressive rule of Solomon, which is a negative. What's my point? It is context that determines if it is positive or negative. It is not negative simply because it's rule. It's negative in this context because that was not God's original intent. You hear me? The word rule itself is not in itself negative, but it's negative in this context because that was not God's original intent. This was an expression of judgment because of their sin. Now, does that mean that all men are going to be brutes, that all men are going to be mean and evil and oppressive to their wives? No. Does it mean that all men are going to be good and benevolent? No. That's the problem of this rule. You don't know really what you're going to get. You don't know what type of rule. It's like the Bible tells us that the powers that be, talking about authoritative powers, are ordained of God. But not, and people have a problem with that because they go, well, wait a minute, you got some rules that are cruel. Yes, God establishes the rule. How the people exercise that rule is dependent upon the person. It comes from them. God does not dictate that. He, I, what I mean, he doesn't dictate it. He wants them with, you have authority to use it on the behalf of others. We're going to be talking about that. But there are people who will use their authority, their power, their influence in negative ways. You never know what you're going to get. Here in America, we, we, we elect presidents. Until they actually get into office, we don't know how they're going to govern until they're in office, whether it's going to be good or bad or indifferent. We don't know. 
in the same way, women, the, the judgment was upon women, your husband will rule over you. Is it going to be good or bad? You don't know. Sometimes it would be benevolent and good. Sometimes it would not be. The point here is that it was not God's original intent. And that's why it's a negative, because it wasn't his original intent. They were to rule together. No one was told originally to rule over the other. Last thing I'm going to say is this. Nowhere in all of the Torah, from Genesis to Malachi, in our English Bibles, nowhere does God directly instruct or tell the man to rule over the woman. There is no direct instruction from God, not even here in Genesis 3.16. God says to the woman, your husband, your, the man will rule over you. Your desire will be for him. He will rule over you. He does not turn around and say to the man, you are to rule over the woman because she is going to be fighting against your rule. He never tells the man to rule. He doesn't command the man to rule. It's not there. So man is never told to rule over the woman. Cain was told if, if the interpretation that we have of Genesis 4, 7 is correct, Cain was told to rule over sin. Adam was never told to rule over Eve. God said to Eve, it's going to happen. He was showing her what's going to happen, but God never actually told the man to rule. Something to think about. All right, that's it right there. I hope you got a lot out of this. I, I hope that you, it was clear. If you need to go back, listen to it again, because I know at one point we got into grammar and linguistics. But the point of all that was to show that Genesis 4-7 is not as clear as people think. And we should not use it in order to interpret, uh, in order to, uh, de to determine how we understand and interpret desire in Genesis 3-16. All right. Next week, I think we're going to begin a little bit more into what was like, I think, Lord willing, what was life like for women in ancient Israel? Were they uh, oppressed? Were, did men rule over them in a harsh way? Did women have no voice? We're going to start looking at that. That's going to help us as we're moving forward to look at and answer the question, who's the boss? What type of relationship are, are men and women supposed to have? That will be what we'll be getting into starting next week. And then we're going to start looking at some women in the Old Testament text as we move forward to the New Test Testament. I just want you to know that coming in the future, I'm going to have scholars on that I will be interviewing and talking about these things. I got some commitments from at least three to four scholars already to come on and actually talk about some of these passages and how they have understood and interpreted them. All right, if this was a blessing to you, I ask you share this with friends. We will be uploading this to our KIC TV YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. So you can direct them there. There you will find all of the other messages plus some other messages that I've done over the past few years. So direct them there. If you, if you have gone there yourself, you haven't, please subscribe, please like. That helps to grow the channel and get our message out to more people. I hope this was a blessing to you. If so, that fulfills my heart and my dream. And what I mean by blessing, that you learn from it, that you got, that it, it, at the very least, it made you think and reconsider. All right? God bless you. Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Bye-bye.